Yes, sir. So, once again, good morning, all my dear participants. I just welcome you all for uh, day four's uh, tenth session uh, for Atal sponsored faculty development program on trends and challenges in electrical vehicles. Today, on day day fourth for uh, the tenth session, we having titled battery thermal management system. For that, it gives me an immense pleasure in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Lakshmi Narasimhan, Associate Professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering, SSN College of Engineering, Chennai. He has 20 plus years of experience in academics and research. His research areas includes cryogenics, energy storage, heat and mass transfer, battery thermal management, electronic cooling. He has received numerous awards and to name few are Pride of Murugappa Award in 2017, Award of Excellence for the research paper presented in the International Conference at NIT Bhopal in 2013, IST REC Calicut Best Project National Award in 2003, received the Honeywell First Runner of Best Idea Award in the Honeywell Eureka Challenge Contest during Tech Expo 2015 and his journey still continues. As a person, he is a motivator and facilitates attitude building. His presence among us is really a blessed moment for all of us. On behalf of Mechanical Department and Sri Ishwara College of Engineering, we welcome you sir for the program. Now the session is yours sir. Oh, thanks a lot and uh for the nice introduction and uh, though i'm not that much kind of uh, you know uh, deserving for uh, much of the great work that you have shared uh, i feel that i should be in the uh, near future um, first of all i would like to extend my sincere thanks to uh Sri Ishwar college of uh, engineering the management the principal the head of the department dr uh, suresh kumar and uh, the faculty members those who are organizing this uh, thanks a lot for uh, giving me this nice opportunity and the topic is also very very impressive uh, and right on target to the current context and uh, thanks aact for this adult uh, kind of you know the uh, encouragement that you are giving that uh, we are all receiving as uh, the uh, aligned institutions with uh, the AACT and thanks AACT for this kind of promotions and it also gives me immense pleasure to thank uh, up front and all all the participants here uh, those who are gathered here those who are knowledgeable already and you know already some of the themes and topics that we are going to discuss and it's only kind of a, a knowledge sharing exercise so thanks for being as a participant for this and I'm sure that uh, some of you or many of you here or uh, eligible to have a kind of a, an invited speaker in somewhere in some part of the conference. So it's only like uh, mutual shifting of the table in and around, that's it. So on that note, I just welcome all my uh, fellow colleagues here and also any student representations here, uh, representatives here, that's also fine and welcome for them also as well. And any industrial people over here, I extend my uh, warm uh, kind of greetings to them. And with a small note of uh, thanks from my part, uh, I would like to start the session. Uh, can I start, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. I'll uh, share my screen. And since this session is going to be online, what I will now do is uh, to save the or conserve the bandwidth. I'll just cut off my, my uh, video. I'll have only the audio and I'll, I'll uh, share the screen. And uh, since it's going to be an online session, there could be some difficulties either side. Uh, so what we will do is if there is any internet issue on your side, I'll wait for 10 to 15 minutes. And if there is any problem from my side, please uh, bear with me for that and wait for 10 to 15 minutes till I make some ordinate arrangements and get back to you again. OK, we can start from where we left and then the connectivity could be like uh, seamless from that board onwards. So we'll pray for the uh, kind of good connection that we need to have, which is now beyond our control. OK, so with this kind of small disclaimers uh, and also the request from my side, I'll proceed on with my presentation. Once again, please. Are you able to see this window, please? Yes, sir. 
yeah once again i'll stop sharing this video also so that it will conserve some bandwidth for us yeah is my screen visible for all of you yes sir shall, shall i go for the slide show mode or uh, let's check it out is it okay now visible right yes sir it is visible sir <laughs> yes sir yes sir and uh, kindly participants you can interrupt me in the big, uh, middle uh, if you would like to have some clarifications otherwise we'll go on a straight go and uh, reserve all the kind of discussions post the uh, you know session we can have either way it's up to you uh, my talk is now going to be on battery thermal management system especially it's lithium ion batteries okay the focus will be though it is only battery it uh, implicitly it means it's going to be on lithium ion batteries we'll see why it is so and so on and so forth okay and this session is going to be organized with some kind of uh, warm up uh, with some statistics followed by a small introduction about the evs and in the current context of evs and we will jump into directly the batteries and uh, sudden jump to the lithium ion batteries and then we'll discuss uh, something about the theme of this talk that the safety issues uh, as regards the lithium ion batteries and the trends that are being followed nowadays and then we'll come to a closure of uh, the session so this is how it's going to be organized. So first uh, 20 or 30 minutes we'll be spending on uh, the general things related to the batteries and the uh, EVs. And then we will, uh, for the next rest of the time, we'll be spending more on uh, discussing about the safety issues and the associated thermal aspects of lithium ion batteries. Just coming to the vehicle scenario of uh, our country, we all know that we are close to 130 to 140 crores of population. And uh, you know the vehicle population is nearly 23% of that. So this, these figures have been arrived based on so many uh, you know, literature. So therefore, it can be plus or minus. So it's, it's not a correct, a kind of a correct or accurate representation. That could be some plus or minus. We are not bothered about it now as of now. It's not going to affect any of our data here. OK, so we have around uh, 30 crores of the vehicle population. And uh, they say that uh, uh, 70,000 to 75,000 new vehicles are getting registered every day. That means that it is uh, uh, 20 to 22.5 lakhs of vehicles every month we are being added. And then uh, they are also getting deleted some portion. Let's not forget, uh, worry about it now. So 25 to 27 million per year, approximately it's getting added and it really adds some kind of, uh, you know, both trouble as well as some kind of, uh, you know, benefits for us. And, you know, we are the fifth largest auto market in the world. So we are behind the US, China, European Union and the Japan. And uh, all eyes are set globally towards India because it's going to be a huge market and that's going to be a huge demand and business is going to go huge. That's what the predictions are. And if you uh, just look at the year-wise annual sales of the vehicles, here you can see that nearly, uh, let's not worry about 1920 because of the pandemic and other things, but still the numbers are closer to that pre-pandemic. So therefore, we see here that uh, around 70 to 75 percent of uh, you know the uh, pollution is from automobiles, and uh, this is what the record says. And why they say like because we have around you know two wheelers in large numbers occupying the space of uh, 80 percent of the total vehicle population, and then 13 percent like say for example 30 lakh cars are flying, and then 1.1.72 crores of uh, two wheelers are flying every day, and then you know 80 percent of the vehicles are going to be two wheelers and just imagine the pollutions that uh, we are going to face. That's why the EV vehicle market is slowly you know, picking up. And then the two wheelers are given a wide attention compared to the uh, four wheelers. And uh, we have other segments as well, like the quadricycles, cycles, which are of the uh, you know kind of uh, standards. And then the three wheelers and the commercial vehicles and all those things occupy only a less portion. So if you clearly uh, just see the trend is growing, let's uh, not worry about 1920. Uh, it's a kind of an exemption. Otherwise, the uh, curve will have a linear kind of, you know, uh, uh, straight away, it's going to be expanding more and more. So people even think that beyond uh, 2030 or something like that, the uh, linear expansion of the curve will be uh, very, very rigorous because of the business potential and a lot of uh, things predicted for India. So therefore, at the outset, what we are going to uh, say from this curve is that uh, there's a big automotive market available for India. And the question is whether it's going to be IC engines or electric vehicles. The, certainly the answer from everyone's heart by now is electric vehicles. It's certainly not the IC engines because it's uh, the era of IC engines is going to come to a close because of so many reasons that we already know. And then um, EV's population, if you consider, uh, it's expected to grow at 
10 crores by 2030. And uh, you know, uh, to uh, support the statistics, we have one lakh electric vehicles registered already for the last year or current year trending and then last three years around they say that uh, this is a phenomenal uh, improvisation in the market of evs five lakh have been registered so it's going to grow more in uh, january 2020 our department of heavy industries have already approved uh, around 2600 uh, electric vehicle charging stations across 62 cities so it is being planned that on the highways for every three kilometers we'll be having one charging station to support our uh, needs for charging the electric vehicles so that's the way india is now growing and looking at and as per the Niti Aayog's report of 2018, uh, we were only having a uh, per thousand uh, 53 vehicles vehicle ownership. Now it has grown to 167. Given the kind of uh, you know urbanization that's happening, uh, even more you can it can the number could be even more in 2021. So if we have the statistics, you can fill it up. It would have crossed 250 even. So and then 79 percent or 80 percent already we know that it's the two wheelers and 14 percent of four wheelers etc. And we need around 10 gigawatt hours to 50 50 gigawatt hours of uh, battery energy by the end of 2025 given the growth rate of evs and certainly it will be more than that even okay by 2030 and there are certain initiatives from the government of india so we have the uh, national electric mobility mission plans and we have the faster adoption in and manufacturing of hybrid and electric vehicles in india we are now in fame two there are two phases fame uh, phase one and phase two under fame so we are in the phase two now and the automotive mission plans is there and the dst's uh, technology platform for electric mobility is also there so and uh, there are so many kind of initiatives and forums available to promote uh, uh, electric vehicles in india and in a global sense, uh, people have already predicted uh, in the literature uh, that that's going to be a phenomenal increase. Uh, uh, if you say the relative increase would be around some 20% to 25%, okay, in the electric share. And then if you consider the hybrid electrics, uh, still that's going to be a growth. And then uh, compared to the gasoline vehicle fuels, it's going to have a drop. So this clearly indicates that there's going to be a 50% reduction in the gasoline market and a 70 to 80% increase in the uh, electric vehicle market. And hybrid electric, yeah, that is going to be certainly a parallel rise. But at some point of time, the hybrid electric will also will, uh, you know, kind of come down and then it's only going to be the fully electric vehicle at some point in time, except the very, very heavy duty and special machineries rest of the diesel or the gasoline fire engines will be absent in the curve that's shown here so probably by another 20 years we need to wait the generation that uh, next is waiting will be seeing one of the curves as regards the evs and some other kind of transportation that is uh, much more conducive to the nature and then the merits everyone know the merits of evs i don't think i need to spend much time on this because it's less pollution or zero pollution they can call but still it is debatable Yes, we are going to pollute somewhat more than that of IC somewhere at some point in uh, some place in the earth because of running the EVs, because we need to produce the batteries, we need to produce or manufacture the components, we need to really expend the energy or burn coal somewhere at some point of time. But still, uh, on a local part where the engines are, where the vehicles are moving, we can claim that it's going to be a non polluting source. So, therefore, on that regards, uh, we can call that it's a kind of a no solu polluting uh, kind of uh, an ambient with evs and no noise definitely it's true and there are places where they want some noise to be heard from the evs it's so silent that people are unable to you know really hear and people those who are sitting inside also doesn't really know whether the vehicle is stopped or it's moving it's that kind of a low noise kind of a system so people are deliberately you know giving some kind of a noise associated a pleasing noise we can call associated with evs so such is the kind of uh, beauty with uh, as regards the evs and then the uh, it has got its own implications and negative effects so we are going to have really uh, a kind of a destructive or a kind of an environment or ecosystem as regards industrially with manufacturing and other sectors we, we are going to really face some trouble mechanical engineering okay so we don't uh, have any more industries that manufactures clutch or transmission systems or particulate filters so many companies are going to be com completely off from the circuit and uh, the livelihood of many people and the small industries are minuscule industries are going to be really really largely affected but they have to live with it and they have to migrate or shift towards some other uh, you know business areas which will uh, you know really uh, kind of you know support or compromise for the, the business loss 
because of the arrival of electric vehicles so those things need to be you know, thought and then uh, the uh, small industries have to self drive in that direction which makes them some kind of a business other than the conventional ones so these are all very very important things so let's go to a brief on the evs uh, uh, in the conventional engine yes you have the fuel and the engine and the transmission and the hybrid electric vehicles you have a series or a parallel arrangement where you can have both together uh, okay for series the battery is going to completely you know uh, drive your motor generator and then the battery is going to be powered only by the engine so engine will not be directly connected to the wheels uh, in the series but in the, but in the parallel mode it's going to be connected both in parallel you can operate as power convenience uh, whatever we want to and then do it whereas in the battery electric vehicle if you see the complete absence of uh, the fuel and the uh, engine uh, makes it surprising uh, and you see here that uh, uh, almost all the components which are essential for uh, major industries to really exist are all completely absent in the battery electric vehicles so any country given will have a traditional jump from the traditional conventional engines to hybrid and then to the path will be from one to next one so from conventional vehicles to hybrid to hybrid to battery electric vehicles but in india we have skipped this path one that is a complete jump from the conventional vehicles directly to the battery electric vehicles which made the challenge already so already people were at a stake when uh, we went for the bar 6 uh, standards so when we went for the bs6 standards there was a big challenge and even before people could migrate to uh, or adapt to bs6 standards uh, the arrival of electric vehicles surprised all the uh, automotive manufacturers because their inventory was there already purchased and uh, huge inventory losses around 6000 to 7000 crores uh, many of the industries have lost and uh, uh, the government said no no we are going to go for the electric vehicles directly so that's the kind of a challenge that india is in on so as uh, faculty members we have a lot of role as mechanical engineers we have a lot of role uh, in uh, making ourselves adjusted to this uh, transition and then make our own way let's have a look at the commercial vehicles yes we have the mahindra toyotas the hondas and the volvos and most of them are very familiar with us so there is no need to kind of you know being much more elaborate on that and then uh, we have the battery capacities depending upon the uh, brand of the engine brand and the company's design it differs so it's 288 ampere hours and 280 ampere hours of lithium ion batteries with charging time that's a worrying factor now it's around 11 hours and 12 hours and with fast charging we can go down to you know minutes even this last can go into minutes okay so uh, now approximately 2 hours and 1.5 but still it's a longer duration still uh, and then the range range has been expanding now far and uh, behind and you know like uh, 140 kilometers and kind of 180 kilometers these are kind of the challenging range people are now looking at they are also now looking at even 300 kilometers uh, range and then the ac induction motors are there and the high power uh, motors are there okay we can even all wheel drive motors also there so lot of challenges and if you look very deeply into the construction and the working of the electric vehicles uh, you'll come to know of all these aspects so it's only an indication from where the data is available or technical data is available on a commercial perspective and just i have uh, uh, highlighted this here and then uh, these are some of the other examples uh, that are coming up now and to say that uh, companies like you know the uh, hyundai are now with their kona uh, varieties they are now uh, into the market and a uh, lot of challenges are there being addressed and buses also electric buses they are giving some prominence and uh, all the way you know the municipality has already initiated with the three wheelers uh, for collecting the uh, you know garbage and other things so uh, all the sanitation workers are being provided with such kind of a battery operated vehicle that we see on the road they are also successful and uh, that's how the market is now emerging and now uh, let's have a glimpse on different other aspects as well as regards uh, the commercial electric vehicles so in terms of the charging time you see uh, it's over and about 6 to 11 hours and in terms of the ranges it's around you know 180 140 to jumping to uh, 300 plus even with the mg motors and hyundai and then uh, with the risk, as regards the battery capacities it uh, spans between 14 to you know 40 or 50 uh, kilowatt hours okay so that's the challenge that's being faced and people are slowly migrating towards uh, high capacity batteries and high capacity motors and the long range vehicles that's the ambition it goes slowly it will get uh, diffused into operating the heavy duty 
trucks as well with uh, electric power and say that only the ice engines or diesel or gasoline will be used only for the local kind of uh, power generating sets so and also in the deep mining operations where heavy machineries are to be operated with the uh, sources uh, gasoline or uh, you know petroleum products only th those places will be having all kind of you know petroleum products otherwise on road uh, a uh, complete absence of that will be there and a complete silence also will be there we can call so that's how the uh, market is going to go and let's now come into the uh, battery segment and batteries as we are all aware of uh, they are capable of supplying as well as storing the electrical energy because this is the only way that we can uh, uh, store uh, know the electrical energy yes you have the uh, you know capacitors uh, ultra capacitors you have okay that's okay but still batteries kind of you know the long range uh, or a kind of a long lasting kind of energy storage facility to the best known available today in the world market is the batteries so there is no dispute on this and batteries as we are aware of it's like uh, two metals two different metals exhibiting different characteristics and they are separated by a kind of an electrolyte and then uh, you know which will allow uh, only the ions to transfer and not the electrons and uh, electrons are moved only through conductors so such kind of arrangement will give rise to kind of you know uh, uh, kind of a current flow so that's how the concept all arose uh, and metals exhibit different electrode potentials that is ability to release electrons so two dissimilar metals for example here so like a galvanic cell zinc and copper you have and then uh, when they are separated and you have the electrolyte separating them and automatically if you connect a conductor so there'll be a flow uh, of the uh, electrons and you get a current this is all known and uh, we have the reactions uh, at the anode as well as so it's a completely electrochemical uh, reaction that's taking care of in batteries and that's how generally the batteries work so this is well known and you know any school student you know will be having a fair knowledge on uh, the galvanic cells and how the piling of the cells are done and all those things and what volta did and all those things okay so if you consider the evolution of the battery technology itself battery is different and battery technology is different okay so here if you consider the battery technology it has got a revolutionary kind of an approach right from 18th century when the first voltaic pile was made using the zinc and tin the copper and the silver so it had a kind of good voltage actually 0.8 to 1.1 volts the moment it was done and then the, when the automobiles were uh, introduced into the market actually the first automobile was on electric vehicles only if i'm right and it was not from the engine side so somehow because of the arrival of the diesels and the petroleum products and the uh, patent filed by Rudolf diesel and all uh, somehow people uh, started discarding the electric vehicles otherwise engines would have uh, been only by electric only so now it is going to be a kind of reversal of the time and we are going back to the original from where it started so world is now trying to but all the damage that we need to do to the environment has been half done almost done because of the plying of uh, the uh, conventional engines with such kind of a massive pollution and with uh, such kind of a uh, low efficiency uh, okay we never cared uh, until some point in time a uh, few years down the lane or 20 years down the lane on the climatic changes and all those things when people were talking about then they realized uh, okay but it is always better than uh, you know late and kind of this thing better late than never so it's a kind of uh, an approach and we have from the 18th century the development or evolution of the battery technologies so we have the old toys and the 19th century jump was to lead acid batteries in 20th century we had the famous alkaline batteries alkaline batteries are now also even very very famous and the nickel metal hydride batteries and the lithium ion also was were introduced in 20th century and uh, you see uh, completely it's taken 21st century is a century for lithium ion batteries it's like a lion we call it a lion actually so it's going to be a lion share for lithium ion okay so 21st century and uh, slowly uh, even this lithium is also now being challenged by this uh, flow batteries so the next generation may be with flow batteries and beyond that we don't know so soon there could also be a sunset for uh, lithium ion batteries as well but as of now the the present world is only looking at uh, uh, lithium ion batteries wherever you go whatever applications that you take uh, immediately that comes to our mind is only the uh, lithium ion batteries so on that note i would feel rather this title or session dedicated is uh, uh, really very very relevant and apt in the current context and in 1913 onwards we had this journey on lithium ion batteries 
and if you consider these uh, primary batteries which are uh, no non reachable batteries non rechargeable batteries yes it has got its own uh, market actually uh, where you uh, know you have uh, this uh, all this uh, hot uh, transplants where it has to run you cannot have a charged battery or battery to be charged now and often when it is implanted into the body of a human or anything else so for biomedical kind of application and space based application multi application where there's there's no reach for any human intervention in that case we cannot have a rechargeable battery you cannot go and plug in and then charge it cannot so on those instances we have the non rechargeable the primary batteries so all the secondary batteries we consider those are rechargeable we have the famous lead acid okay and the uh, nickel metal hydride batteries and the lithium ion batteries you see the market share and uh, of lithium ion batteries it's very huge because it's uh, what our specific energy uh, uh, tends to be called as specific energy is very high lithium ion is very high so therefore this will contribute the compactness of it so this is uh, the one catch from the lithium ion okay so that's how it goes even the primary battery segment you see lithium ion batteries are uh, catching up very well in the market so uh, that's the way it's going okay and then let's go directly to the uh, lithium ion batteries now so from the talk what we have understood this we have understood the scenario and we have deeply put inside that uh, electric vehicles are going to take the uh, next future of uh, mobility and uh, for the electric vehicle yes it needs kind of a battery and we have enough number of batteries and battery technologies have evolved over a period of time and it is now the era of lithium ion batteries and that's what exactly we are in into the slide we'll be discussing about the uh, lithium ion batteries uh, in the middle i would before going to this i would like to hear from the audience is this okay the way in which it's being uh, done this presentation or would you like to uh, slow or uh, adjust depending upon your kind please let me hear from you yes sir audience sir it's sir sir it okay? uh, the way in which we are proceeding is okay yes sir it's okay sir Okay. Participant search message uh, chat box and chat box, sir. Okay, I'm not able to see the chat box because I'm the full screen mode. Yes, sir. They are saying it's perfect. Okay, fantastic. So yeah. that gives me a kind of encouragement. Okay, right. And then let's go to uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, you see, like any general battery, you have the cathode, you have the anode. So here, the representation is very important. Like uh, we call the positive electrode the PE as a cathode, and the negative electrode as the anode. So we have to be very careful in uh, addressing these uh, nomenclatures very, very carefully. Okay, because it will be definitely different in case of the uh, uh, you know, fuel cell and other things. Okay, so have to be very careful with the battery terminologies and battery nomenclatures so uh, we have the separator which separates the anode and cathode uh, because uh, to avoid the short circuits or direct contact between the plus and the minus will lead to a short circuit so we have to basically avoid that internally and then you have the current collectors which actually collects the current and then it via the terminals it will pass through the uh, to the terminal so we have battery terminals and obviously electrolyte should be there which is the major carrier of the ions but not the electrons so these are all the regular kind of uh, you know components in a battery if you say so lithium ion battery is no different from this so you have the, all these uh, stuff inside it packed it in terms of layers and be arranged and multiple uh, kind of uh, such arrangements will be done and uh, fused as one cell it will be manufactured as one cell so you have the uh, we'll see about the uh, don't worry about the materials that it has been given here let's see about it in the next few slides so just for the moment just assume that these are the basic or essential components of uh, any lithium ion battery and then uh, you see a commercial lib lithium ion battery consists of a negative electrode made of a copper foil how it is being made is coated specially with a mixture of carbonaceous material employing a binder and a carbon black material so that's what is very that's how the inactive electrode is being made so they take a copper foil and then coat it with a special mixture of carbonaceous materials and then the binder and all those things similarly positive electrode will also be done like this instead of copper they take an aluminium foil and then coat it over with a mixture of lithium based metal oxides binder and carbon black and then the electrolyte electrolyte is an organic solvent here consisting of lithium salts with a good ionic diffusion rates that's very important if it is not going to diffuse the ions through at a uh, particular rate then uh, it will not be useful for uh, the proper uh, voltage to be maintained and uh, the batteries will ultimately fail will not deliver the required uh, requisite current 
and the electrolyte employed is an organic solvent consisting of lithium salts with good ionic diffusion rates. In general, uh, lithium ion batteries may have the liquid electrolytes or the solid state electrolytes. Now to say that solid state electrolytes are being given more focus or more attention uh, because these liquid electrolytes are flammable whereas uh, solid state electrolytes are not flammable. So that is one important point to be noted. Though I have not mentioned it over here, it's very important. But still, if you consider the ionic diffusion rate, it's, uh, you know, very low with the uh, solid state electrolyte. So if the research is happening on improving the ionic diffusion rates of uh, solid state electrolytes or making the liquid electrolytes non-flammable, either way, they will be complementary to each other. And that's how the, uh, you know, electrolyte, uh, this thing will happen, uh, research will happen. And this will ultimately lead to improving the overall performance of the lithium ion batteries. So there are best examples for the solid state electrolytes. So the chemical, uh, these things are known. Chemicals are given here. We can uh, we can make a note of it. And then we'll jump to the next slide uh, for uh, more references uh, in case of you know knowing about the battery materials and all those things. I would suggest uh, people to uh, just have a glimpse at your convenience. Uh, go to these journals and you can get a lot of uh, stuff through these. So more the reading, more will be the knowledge that we gain through this and uh, the research scope will also be you know, better when uh, going through such kind of stuff. So these are only the listed, some of the representative cases. You Apart from this, you have uh, thousands and thousands of literature available. Okay, so we can always refer to that. And then the mechanism. Uh, mechanism is straightforward here as with common batteries. In the case of charging, so from the positive electrode, what happens is the uh, uh, lithium ions deintercalate first. So it will deintercalate from the, the respective lattice positions and then uh, it will move towards the, you know, the negative electrode, which is the anode, uh, and then go and intercalate. This is again charging. Sorry? Hello? Sir, can I proceed? Sir, yes, sir, sir, you can proceed, yeah. sir. Okay. Because there was some voice in the middle, that's why. Okay. So uh, we have the charging, regular charging that's happening uh, from the movement of the ions from the positive electrode towards the negative electrode and the electrons are pushed to the anode and uh, during the discharging process where you would like to take the current for the load uh, what happens is the other way happens like uh, the ions are being again deintercalating from the anode and goes back to the you know the uh, positive electrode which is the cathode and then intercalates there and then the electrons will start moving from the anode with the start it becomes a supplier of your uh, you know electrons and then it goes so the oxidation and the you know the reduction happens here in the cathode so anodic oxidation and the cathode reduction will be there and uh, if you look at the general uh, you know reactions so we'll not care more about the reactions because you might have done this already with your uh, other sessions as well i hope so and uh, our focus is not on the reaction side and we'll not discuss more on this reaction just have a glimpse on how the reactions are and all those things materials we'll come to the materials in another one or two more slides we'll be focusing on the materials so don't worry about it now just take it as is there is a reaction there and the anodic reaction and the cathodic reaction the overall reactions just have a look at it that's enough and the transfer of the ions from uh, the anode to cathode and the cathode to anode during charging and the discharging because it's rechargeable it can be done at the expense of some energy it can be done okay and uh, this is how the overall reaction again just put for uh, your convenience to know more on uh, the reactions okay and then let's go to the uh, development of LIBs this is very interesting because we are going to do something on LIBs so we should know the development of LIBs like battery battery development battery technology development similarly the technology is there but now the development should be seen in a different perspective we'll see this and lithium you know we all know that uh, you know it was discovered by Johan August uh, and then uh, named by him as uh, lithium. Okay, that's it. It was named as lithium. And then in 1870s, you see it has been named as lithium and it was available from 1817. But put to a major use only after, you know, some 200 years. Okay, so uh, lithium has an atomic number three, it's a lightweight metal with a density 50% that of water. So it's around, uh, you know, 530 kg per meter cube. And uh, it has the high energy density. That's very, very important. Being less density, but the energy density is very high. Okay. So mass density is very less, but the energy density is very high. So that's really a natural gift, we can say. And the availability is also very little. And it is suited for developing high voltage battery cells. That's a finding of the catch with this metal. And then, uh, you know, 
uh, lithium is a relatively reactive metal also. That is one other uh, disadvantage. So which has to be protected from air or water. That's very important. Like sodium reacting with air, lithium also reacts with air. So therefore, we have to be very, very careful because it reacts heavily with uh, air and water. So therefore, uh, aqueous uh, kind of uh, electrolytes are not permitted with the LABs. That caution has to be there. So uh, they are uh, enemies, we can call water and uh, lithium are enemies. Okay, so propylene carbonates have been deployed as potential electrolytes. So this was the outcome of some PhD thesis done by uh, uh, Dr. Harris way back in 1958. So people will even say that that was a, a, a kind of a, a revolutionary PhD thesis. And because of that only people thought of uh, getting a bright market into the LIBs. Okay, so therefore uh, this polypropylene carbonates was the catch as a potential electrolyte. Uh, it was the outcome. So every PhD thesis or research should have an outcome. So it's a beautiful outcome because of this uh, you know, thesis and we should all thank uh, Dr. Harris for this great contribution. And then at the time of the lithium ion development, it was assumed that the metallic lithium would serve as the anode. So that was the first conceived idea. Let's say what uh, the anode is the lithium metal itself and special focus was on finding the right candidates for the cathodes. So people thought that yes, we have anode as a lithium, lithium as the anode and then we'll look for the bright uh, you know, cathode materials. So they wanted to find some materials which can host uh, the uh, lithium ions. So they found that titanium disulfide, okay, so was able to you know host the lithium ions way back in 65 you see that 1958 we had a thesis and 1965 seven years down the lane they found a good material for uh, the cathode and uh, for the electrolyte they had 1958 a solution and 1965 they had a solution for uh, both anode and the best cathode material so they found the structure was lamellar and uh, titanium disulfate was used okay and then later what the uh, discovery was like uh, people used uh, uh, lithium based titanium disulfates and that was also found to be excellent kind of uh, uh, intercalation and all those things so that's how people were doing the research and it was developing and successfully 1976 1817 they have found this lithium but in 1976 it's one day after that so they were able to see how about 150 to 160 years people successfully developed lithium and batteries and this is how typically it functions like okay so you have a anode metallic lithium and then uh, you have a cathode and then the transfer of ions will take place during the charging the discharging that's how it went on and uh, best electrolytes were taken okay so this uh, lithium pf6 as the electrolyte and propylene carbonate was taken as the solvent and later it was tetramethyl borate and dioxalane all these things electrochemical uh, kind of electrochemistry was happening and uh, the electrochemical engineers came up with bright solutions which gave a cell electromotive force of 2.5 volts so initial current density was 10 milliamps per centimeter square all those things were happening and uh, there was some issue the issue was this what happens was like suppose you have a kind of a anode uh, material made of the metallic lithium if the anode was made of metallic lithium suddenly after a few cycles of operation some dendritic structures like in the caves because of the calcium deposits it grows right similar to that some deposits grew inside it inside the battery it grew and what it did was it was so sharp that it penetrated, it grew and grew and grew. It penetrated the separator, which separates the uh, direct, uh, it avoids direct contact of anode and cathode, which separates anode and cathode. Now it is broken because of this sharp structures and it grew and it started touching. And then the uh, whole short circuiting happened internally. Like external short circuiting, this is called internal short circuiting and sudden explosion or sudden firing, all those things happen. So people thought that to avoid some waves of, you know, uh, inhibiting this growth of dendrites. So this was a major challenge. So people thought that we should not go with the metallic oxides for the anode. So what happened was they came up with an idea called ion transfer cells. So ion transfer mechanism was uh, put in 1938 by uh, Rudolf and people thought of doing something with this. So what they did was like, uh, so why this dendrite formation? So both electrodes were replaced by graphite materials. This was the major uh, breakthrough. So if you have the anode oxide uh, uh, metals as the uh, anode, you have this dendrite formation. So they started replacing with graphite. So graphite completely stopped the formation of uh, you know dendrites, and there was no problem at all. But still, there was some other problem. 
because if you uh, stop one problem, there'll be another problem. The other problem was the ion transfer cells uh, had some issues of exfoliation that, uh, and then the destruction of the electrodes after some repeated cycles. So it uh, fell off from the surface where it was coated. All those things happened. So there was again a challenge after challenge. One in 1979 to 80, there was some other breakthrough finding. Okay. So a breakthrough came in 79s and 80s when uh, Goodenough and his co-workers at the Oxford University discovered that the lithium X and the uh, cobalt oxides could serve as the best cathode material. Another breakthrough happened in 1985. So these are two milestones, Akira Yoshino. So we can't forget these two names, Goodenough and Akira Yoshino, both are Nobel laureates. So 2019 Nobel laureates, they have been given the Nobel Prize for only uh, this contribution. Okay, and many other contributions and uh, this thing uh, which followed this. Okay, so this was uh, really great. And LIB's lithium-ion batteries had started a new journey. It turned out to be with Yoshino's anode and Goodenough's cathode. It, uh, okay, so people even spoke like this. It's anode, it's Yoshino's anode. If it is cathode, it's Goodenough's cathode. So with a water-free electrolyte composed of uh, this lithium, this uh, hexafluoride kind of this thing, phosphorus hexafluoride, in the polypropylene carbonate as the electrolyte. So they found that the best voltage that they have been 4.1 volts with 80 watt hour per kilogram energy density. This was a major contribution. And that's how it went through. And again, if you solve one problem, you end up with another problem. There is some other problem actually waiting. That's what the whole session is going to uh, really be dedicated to. Okay, and uh, we have another uh, you know set of these things, and people started using the graphite and the petroleum cokes, all beauty kind of these things with anode materials, and we have the good enough scattered material. All these things are fantastic enough, but still challenge after challenge, this lithium-ion uh, batteries are facing. Okay, and then new versions have developed based on that. So you have uh, uh, LIMN04, and now the uh, lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese varieties are also there. So they are evolving. Okay. LFP batteries, LMNO batteries, LMO batteries, all these things are very, very, uh, you know, uh, well known to this uh, LIB family. And uh, they have different configurations as well, cylindrical, prismatic, and the pouch batteries, everybody know that. And you have customized the kind of ampere hours, customized ratings, customized uh, kind of performance. So, but the problem is like the heat generation that we are going to talk in a few minutes down the lane. It's just I printed it in red color, you can see that. They are going to be different for different batteries. And uh, Tesla, as all of us are aware, Tesla is a very good competitor for uh, the, uh, the battery industry. And uh, they are uh, into uh, kind of state of the art batteries. Okay. And Sony is another big competitor. Okay. So people are evolving with their own uh, techniques and methods of uh, you know, batteries. But all are with the lithium ion batteries. Okay. And then. Uh, General rechargeable batteries, you have, uh, you know, the lithium ion, nickel, metal hydride, and the nickel cadmium, the lead acid batteries, the temperature ranges at 35 to 40 degrees centigrade and all those things. And then some important terminologies before we proceed on. Uh, the state of charge, the depth of discharge, the capacity, uh, capacity we say in ampere hours, and then the energy, so watt hours, and the specific energy, watt hours per kilogram, power is watt per, specific power is watt per kg, and C, rate, C rating. C rating we will discuss soon. Okay, it's the rate at which the current is charged or discharged. That's very important. That's called the C rating of batteries. And now let's come to the topic of the session. Lithium-ion batteries uh, consider the future powerhouse. Okay, so why? Why lithium-ion batteries? What are the exceptional qualities that they have? First thing is, uh, you know, uh, they are having high energy and power densities. And uh, they have uh, the large charge to discharge cycles that we see in often in cell phones also. Okay, so we have large number of uh, cycles and no self discharge. This is excellent property. It will not self discharge, but still it, it's being claimed that uh, they will do have a discharge, but no self discharge in the sense like uh, its rate is very, very slow, very, very slow and nil battery memory effect. I'm not going to deal too much on the battery memory effect. Okay, because it, it's a different science that we are talking about and it will take another 20 minutes or 25 minutes unnecessarily. But I hope that this term would have been covered uh, in the earlier lectures or maybe the lectures that are in uh, queue after this. Okay, so lightweight and uh, compactness. This is one other very, very important, uh, uh, you know, saleable kind of a property, unique property. Use the USP for uh, the uh, lithium and batteries because it's lightweight and compact. And then 
price is decreasing as we are aware of and integration with iot is uh, possible here so you can uh, connect with any of the uh, you know raspberry pis or even this thing you can make it digital also that's how uh, you know the battery uh, state of charge is being uh, you know displayed in our all our mobile phones and even the computers you see how much of the battery is left and how much long it come to all those things are digitized because it could be tracked very easily and uh, you see the power uh, density or the uh, you know you see the energy density you have the uh, 25 for the lead acid and is uh, 150 for the lithium ion so somewhere this little nickel metal hydrate is in between okay and then uh, demerits so you have you have equal number of merits and equal number of demerits okay so first is they start to degrade once away from the production shop okay so there is no self discharge correct but the degradation happens once it's away once it's packed degradation stops and then the generate uh, high heat during charging and discharging this is the key aspect actually this is the one major aspect we can call this is the tricky and kind of a challenge that is posed to engineers and then the lifespan is three to five years and then extremely sensitive to high temperatures it is connected to your heat generation as well and the complete discharging would ruin the battery that's why we can't go to zero percent of complete uh, discharge of with these batteries and uh, Overcharging is also kind of you know very important. We should not do that. And safety issues in terms of fire hazards and bursts, this is another. And day in and day out, we hear somewhere and some point the bursting of cell phones. The uh, even the recent uh, there is I don't want to name the company. Uh, okay, so there is an issue that's ongoing because of the burst of the cell phone in one's pocket. Okay, and then the firing of uh, you know some other. Uh, uh, good brand cell phones immediately when they introduce in the market so people have to really discard or call back all the products and then do something that's also a phenomenal good company i don't want to name the company okay so those things are all well known and uh, explosion and uh, deaths also due to the explosion of uh, lithium and battery uh, you know application that is also known to all of us okay and dendrite growths and uh, more safety requirements are required with uh, liquid coal and so on and so forth so these are all the demerits it warrants some kind of a cooling system actually these are all the demerits when you want to use a battery you have to allied with that you have to use some other thing also for its protection so this protective equipments are very important for these batteries and let's go to the state of that batteries and you see here as per our niti Aayog's report they recommend certain batteries so nmc batteries are there so nickel manganese cobalt oxides will be there so lithium nickel manganese cobalt as the cathode and the graphite is the anode the nmc ltvo batteries are there so titanium oxide batteries are there so titanium oxide will be uh the your uh, anode and uh, lithium nickel manganese cobalt will be a cathode and lfp batteries are there lithium ferrous or uh, phosphorus batteries as the cathode and graphite is the anode and each nmc or nmc ltvo or lfp they have their own uh, you know merits and uh, minutes so there is an order also they call you can go by that order also okay so uh, it can be uh, you know written like this and they are compact here there, there's no need to you know discuss on this too much you can always have the slide and uh, go through this to understand which one is better for uh, which kind of an application okay and uh, LFE batteries are now being discontinued okay due to huge costs involved in the low specific energy and uh, you you have uh, very good uh, you no know, lithium ion batteries of uh, lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxides uh, okay and then the nca batteries also there nickel cobalt aluminum oxides okay that is also there and all the famous car companies they have started using all these type of batteries and how these batteries are present like uh, it can be cylindrical it can be prismatic it can be any other pouch batteries like it be arranged as a stack we call this a kind of a module many batteries arranged will form a module and many modules arranged will come will become a pack a battery pack so therefore uh, uh, cells to form the module and modules to form the pack this is how it is arranged and it needs to be cooled so you see a cold plate is being there shown here because it needs to be cooled without uh, cooling it it will not operate okay that's very important and uh, this is how it's getting packed in various uh, you know uh, this thing so here you can google it and you can find all those images nice images and see how it is being packed cylindrical batteries or how they are packed you can have your own customized design that is no kind of uh, no how I many you can have your own design and uh, pack it the way in which you want for a particular application and let's go directly into the uh, main or the crux of this uh, topic okay so we see here uh, the thermal management trends in lithium-ion batteries. Okay, let's go to basically the vehicle thermal management. If you take a vehicle thermal management, uh, you have two things, two issues. One is the uh, 
energy or thermal management should be done for our own comfort, passenger comfort. That's the air conditioning systems. If it's a cold country, you need to also heat it. So you need to do that air conditioning. For air conditioning, you need one power source. Because if it's going to be all driven by the electric vehicle, the power has to be given only from the batteries. There is no other engines available to you know really uh, get the power or draw the power from. So therefore, it's only the battery has to be packed. So battery has to be designed not only to run the vehicle, but also to take care of the other aspects. One aspect is the air conditioning aspect, the vehicle mobile air conditioning, or okay. And other one is the battery thermal management. Because you're using lithium-ion batteries, you have to exclusively have a kind of an arrangement for uh, cooling it. So you need uh, a sumptuous amount of uh, heat load to handle. So the vehicle thermal management in total will be comprising of these two and then uh, as already told it needs to be used and you are uh, not allowed to use the ic engines anymore so therefore you have to depend completely on the green source okay and then what's battery thermal management now in terms of lithium ion batteries what is it now okay we'll see about it you see uh, overheating of batteries occur during the high current discharge if you start to discharge current from the lithium ion batteries at your rate for example you draw one amps Suddenly you draw two amps. Suddenly you draw three amps. The way in which, say, like in cell phones, so you operate only YouTube. You have some heating. You parallelly work on some other app, some gaming, some app. Something is running behind. All those things, if you do in a cell phone and touch the cell phone, few minutes down the lane, you can see that it gets heated up. Where is the heat coming from? It's coming from the only thing is that we are operating too many applications at a time in our cell phone or in laptop. There we see more current is being drawn to operate those apps and that's how more heat is generated and it could be detrimental also okay so therefore uh, overheating of the batteries if it is in the case of a cell phone that much amount of heat think of electric vehicles where you have thousands of batteries arranged so unimaginable kind of heat so heat transfer engineers and the uh, refrigeration engineers of god are kind of a lion's share in the market of uh, lithium ion batteries uh, research opportunities are there uh, very great opportunities out there. And then uh, overheating is common during the acceleration of a vehicle. If it's an electric vehicle with uh, lithium ion batteries, if you want to accelerate the vehicle, yes, you draw more current. And you climb up the hill, yes, you draw more current. So these are the spots or the places, the instances where you generate a lot of heat. And heating issues are common with large batteries. If the battery size is very large, huge heating will happen. And if the ambient temperatures like uh, the hot and humid, kind of climates in uh, you know Tamil Nadu and all these equator countries uh, near to that we have already you know uh, the hot climate or hot ambient and that's again one more challenge and cold start issues like this one the counterpart is like the cold start issues in the cold countries instead of uh, you know sunshine they have the snow as a problem so here they need to uh, heat the batteries in our cases we need to cool the batteries for them they need to heat the batteries because of some stringent operating limits of the lithium ion battery they will not function even laptops we can see suppose if we operate the laptops in a well air conditioned room at after some point of continuous uh, exposure to the cold environment the mouse will stop moving you can see that then we have to warm up the laptops taking it outside and then the mouse will start to function so we can see all those things kind of things happening with uh, you know the laptops and the batteries which are powered by the demand batteries they have a stringent operating temperature you have to maintain within that temperature range now let's directly go to the heat generation part now so it's important to know certain terms before proceeding on one is called the c rating of batteries already we have just hinted upon while seeing about the terminologies of batteries now it is very important as regards the lithium ion batteries and next we have to talk about thermal abuse and thermal runaway thermal propagation one more term is there okay so these terms and terminologies are quite frequent when you deal about lithium and batteries you need to ask mechanical engineers as heat transfer engineers we need to talk on these terms c dating thermal abuse thermal runaway so technically heat generation cannot be avoided that's one kind of uh, you know research opportunity for us because it cannot be avoided in batteries as the electrochemical reaction is exothermic in nature and the heating is essentially due to joule heating and the uh, entropy change during the electrochemical reactions so this i square r is your joule heating so that is very important so that cannot be avoided and entropy change yes 
you can design a very good electrochemical reaction and see that the entropy change is not that much so therefore you can have a control but still uh, it will be there you can't avoid it so therefore these two are going to contribute to your uh, heat generation and the amount of contribution will differ based on the state of charge uh, it will also differ based on your uh, you know the current being uh, charged or discharged that's very important for us and uh, for a given battery the extent of charge now let's come to c rating c rating is like it's a kind of the amount uh, of current that is being drawn in a one hour period that's called as the uh, c rating suppose if i say 1c that means 1 ampere being discharged in one hour that's called as 1c rating for a 1 ampere hour battery suppose for example if i say a 2 ampere hour battery if i say it's a 1c discharge that means 2 amperes taken in one hour so if you multiply this 2 amperes in one you'll get 2 ampere hours so this 2 ampere hour multiplication if you multiply two quantities you should get the same number actually remember that way if it is a 2c operation that means time will be divided by 2 that means 30 minutes instead of one hour it has to be 30 minutes then the current has to double okay so if it's a 5c operation for example if it's a 5c operation then one fifth of an hour that means 12 minutes okay in 12 minutes you can draw now you know uh, the uh, requisite amount of uh, you know 10 amperes and 10 amperes can be drawn from two ampere hour batteries but only for 12 minutes and it will drain so like that it goes if it is 0.5 c is less than 1 c no problem at all because slowly you're going to draw the current you're going to you know you're going to draw only one ampere drawn for two hours so the time can be extended the ampere can be less uh, reduced or the ampere is uh, increasing you want to draw more current the time will come down so like that uh, it adjusts itself for a given battery and you're at liberty to draw more current it's like saving in a bank one lakh rupees and if you want to draw one one rupee per day you can take or at short you want to draw fifty thousand in two days it'll vanish so it's like the wave in which we use okay so that is called the c rate okay the more the c rate the more the current will be drawn 8c 9c 10c if you go the current drawn will be enormous the more the current more the heating and more the problem will be less the c rate less than 1c fantastic you go with 0.1c 0.2c 0.3c 0.4c the heat generation will be very very less but if you cross 1c and go beyond 2c 3c 5c up to 9c you go there large problems are going to be hit that we will see now so compared to other batteries heat generation is quite significant in the case of lithium ion batteries and more pronounced at c rates above 1c more current is either charged in or discharged from the batteries and now heat generation will be according to that as we have already mentioned and uh, we'll go to the third term called thermal abuse this is very very important in case of accidents okay so what happens is uh, the batteries will get smashed and then there'll be a contact uh, between the cathode anodes it'll break and all those things happen and uh, that could lead to a kind of an abuse so thermal abuse can be like uh, uh, that could be overheating because of you know the accidents and uh, misunderstanding of the batteries rupture due to penetration of the metals external or internal short circuiting etc all those will lead to a kind of a thermal abuse and mechanical abuse and electrical abuse actually we split it into three but everything is going to lead to thermal kind of thing as well uh, result only okay so thermal failures only so therefore thermal failures we can call it could be because of accidents or mishandling of the batteries or rupture due to the penetration of some metals and external or internal short circuiting okay due to dendrite formation all those things so that is very important so at any point of time you should take care that battery abusing should not be there whether it's going to be electrical abusing or mechanical abusing or thermal abusing thermal abuse comes from heating also suppose if the external heating suppose some source is there to heat it up so that's called as a thermal abusing and uh, you know thermal runaway so this is very very important phenomenon. this is the only term that is driving the entire market of liv we can call thermal runaway we say it's a tr okay so tr is called as the thermal runaway mechanism so thermal runaway is a phenomenon where the heat generation is so huge to handle within a short period of time by the coolants that's being circulating over it so therefore what happens is it leads to immediate kind of melting of the materials inside the batteries and lead to short circuiting and firing and explosion all those things will happen 
And just to put it in a nutshell, you have the uh, total heat generation as a sum of the joule heating and the heating due to entropy losses. And you can always quantify these terms, how to get this joule heating, how to get the entropy term. And uh, entropy term can be obtained once the open circuit voltage of a particular battery is known. For every state of the charge, uh, you can have this, how this uh, V0 or the open circuit voltage degree, that also can be known by doing extensive experiments on a given battery. Okay, it can be measured. Uh, so there are many methods available to measure that. So the uh, GITT is uh, one important method and the polynomial regression is another method. Calnostatic intermittent titration technique is a good technique that's followed. Electrochemical engineers will be aware of this, if not the mechanical engineers in total. Okay. And then uh, typical heat generation rate. That's what we also predicted in a recent publication for a given battery. Uh, we have done the calculation for 45 ampere hour battery and predicted that 1C, 2C and uh, 3C operations, the kind of heat generation uh, with the source. And similarly, the typical numbers uh, given by different batteries, by different people, uh, okay, these are the volumetric heat generation rates that are uh, there for uh, typical batteries at a 2C operation. So in terms of uh, wattage, if you call, we'll generate around five watts per uh, cell for these kind of uh, batteries. Okay, so that is very, very important. You see maximum is 135 amperes of 150 kilowatts battery. So these are all very, very important. And then, uh, to dissipate this heat, a proper cooling mechanism is very, very important. That's very important. And let's see the thermal risks associated with the heat generation. What happens if LEDs are not properly cooled? So that's a question to be put. So let's see the associated risk. The first risk is overheating of the batteries. And then thermal runaway issues, TR. Then the ignition. Then the thermal propagation. This is another important research term that's being addressed. The next important research, the battery research has now gone far away from the general batteries to addressing the thermal runaways and from thermal runaways people are now addressing thermal propagation it's not like uh, we'll see about thermal propagation soon so the causes as we said thermal abuse electrical abuse and mechanical abuses but actually strictly speaking everything will lead to only thermal failures even if it's a mechanical abuse finally it is the heat electrical abuse finally it is the heat thermal abuse it's already the heat so therefore, in one word, we can say all these are going to be indirectly focusing or pointing fingers towards the thermal failures only. So we need to take care that uh, all these risks associated with thermal is mitigated, or is avoided. Okay, so these abuses should never happen. If you design an electric vehicle, if you design any vehicle per se, for any application, you see that for that battery, these three things doesn't happen at all at any point of time. So this is very, very critical. We call it packaging. This packaging is very, very important and critical. And uh, people have made research for a cylindrical battery. People have made researches to find how this heating actually happens. So first they start, this is a kind of, kind of a, a simulation uh, with, uh, you know, for the thermal abuse. Suppose you have a heater at the bottom of the cell and then you start heating the cell. Let's see what's going to happen. So the people made research and uh, this has been given by some researcher. I've taken this for your reference for academic interest and showing the same here. Uh, it's available in the publication already. And uh, we are going to go with the literature background only and discuss on these uh, issues in the later part of the slide. So you will see everywhere the source from where I have taken this will be available. You can go to that publication and get more knowledge reading that. Okay. So you see how it is happening. First, you have the cell getting heated up. Once it gets heated up, you see slowly the uh, there is a safety valve given in each and every battery nowadays. So there's a small valve, safety valve. It will open up and then the, all the gases which are accum getting accumulated because of the heating or the liberated gas because of the electrochemical reactions will come out of that. So first uh, saving mechanism uh, of the explosion. But still uh, we can't do that. Even if the safety valve opens, you see the smoke coming out through the safety valve like uh, steam coming out from a pressure cooker. It goes and now you see the vigorous reaction. Within a minute, these all uh, take only a few seconds. That's all. There is no time available, actually. And then, uh, you know, uh, firing and final firing out of that, you know, completely extinguishing of all the fires after it completely burnt. So this is what they have done, this experiment, and then found out the way in which it's going to burn. You see, finally, what had happened. Okay, this also could happen in case of uh, your overcharging. If you charge, overcharge the batteries, this can be the result. Okay. And, uh, you know, the temperatures, the uh, history, temperature history people have measured during the thermal runaway through simulations, you see it predicts to around uh, 400 to 500 degrees centigrade in an instant after this uh, thermal uh, runaway is happening. 
when the thermal runaway happens you see here what's happening the temperature shoots from around you know you start from around 25 degrees centigrade and finally uh, it goes to 200 plus degrees centigrade in no time in just 100 seconds less than a minute that's what i said the time taken is in, in the order of seconds you you have got no choices at all actually you can't even look at what could be done next so you have to be prepared to face the situation within seconds everything will happen within seconds so you you in a real scenario it will be even less than this so therefore we have to be very careful with the temperatures it goes to 200 degrees centigrade instantaneously you see the peak that is being raised so in 150 to 170 seconds to just less than a few seconds five seconds or eight seconds, like a rocket it shoots up and not only that one one particular cell is undergoing a thermal runaway problem it goes or triggers a thermal runaway the next cell are adjacent cells you see the adjacent cells also in this experiment that is also having a trigger in the same time or uh, just few seconds down the lane that's all it happens okay so we have to be very very careful in handling such scenarios and this is what is the result of it so people have captured all these things and these are quite common very recently you might have seen that in one prominent country bus a new bus which is worth at least some 50 crores when they charge it within no time it burnt charging not even discharging. So people are now into the market of fast charging. I have not hinted upon that here. I have left it out as some kind of a, an extra kind of uh, terminology, but I would like to post it at the end of this uh, session so that it triggers on you for further reading. Okay. So this is what will happen with uh, an improper cooling. If you don't cool, if you don't take care of the batteries, if you abuse the batteries, this is the end result. Then think of the people inside it. It could be fatal. We don't know whether they are live or not. We don't know that. So it's a very sorry, sorry set of affairs to discuss on these things because these are the problems. But anyway, the uh, run, uh, market run on the future of LIBs are not going to be stopped because of this. It's uh, because we know accidents, but we don't stop flying our vehicles. We still go. Like that, uh, vehicles do have accidents because of the LIBs, but still the journey goes on and on, meeting or winning all the challenges technologically and then uh, these are some of uh, the other experiments that people have done with the cylindrical batteries and uh, to see how it is getting propagated from one cell to another almost all the cells you see one two three four five six seven eight nine almost all almost all okay so they have underwent this thermal uh, failures you can see this and the temperature shoot up you see 400 plus degrees centigrade can't even imagine in no time Okay, this is the order of the temperature and uh, you know, uh, these are detrimental to the entire battery. So the uh, polymer uh, membrane, whatever is present here, polypropylene membrane, which is uh, you know, separating between this will melt at, you know, uh, around uh, 120 degrees or 130 degrees. That's all. That's all. Short circuiting happens and immediately it will trigger. So that's the main problem. And you see, this is what is going to happen with the firing of an LIB with one battery under a thermal runaway situation. You see here, how much of, uh, you know, the debris, we are talking about the pollutions. Here, this is another major pollution. What happens when it spills out in the atmosphere? You have thousands of such batteries. So, particulate matter emissions. So, this is another type of emissions that we are talking about from the batteries. As long as the batteries are safely operated, we don't have any issues. The moment you are crossing the limits, that's it. So we need to worry about the, you know, pollutions and other aspects on these things. So this is what firing is going to happen when a lithium ion battery pack uh, in, in, in a passenger electric vehicle is abused. Okay. And see the temperatures again, the shooting of temperature, every researcher, whenever they do, they literally find out a similar kind of a trend that's happening. It all depends on the state of charge of the batteries also. A undercharged battery is okay. But a hundred percent or nearly full charge battery is harmful, deadly, deadly harmful, because it's a pack of energy. If thermal runaway happens for a battery with this uh, already, you know, discharged by 75 percent or state of the charge is only 25 percent. OK, but still you have the problem, but still it is not as bad as the problem with a fully charged battery. So that's why we have to be very, very careful when operating with uh, new batteries. We have to be hundred percent careful because new batteries are very, very rigorous or violent in their response compared to old aging batteries. And sometimes old aging batteries will fail very quickly 
compared to the new batteries. So all those things are there as challenges. We need to find out what is what in it. And you see some other researchers have picturized the thermal propagation. As I said, more than the thermal runaway, thermal propagation is important. As the name implies, it will propagate from one battery to another, to another, to another. It will propagate to the neighboring cells. You need to arrest the fire. If you don't arrest the fire, the entry, uh, entire pack will be blasted off. Okay, so it's really very dangerous. That's how you see like uh, a building shop, you have the, uh, you know, expulsion of uh, this uh, flame and uh, this thing like that fire you have this uh, in the batteries if you see c1 you can easily see that like in a welding shop you no know, uh, you have the gust of uh, this tiny flames you see here the sparks emitting sparks you see a, a, a kind of you know jet of sparks you see it's being issued and then you see the whole firing so before firing you see the jet of sparks and then after firing it's chaos and not only this, it emits toxic gases. That's very important. And toxic gases, if it is inhaled by the drivers and the passengers who are sitting inside, and I'm so sorry to say that uh, that's it. That's the end of it. So we can't even imagine what next. And no time. The time frame for the C1 to C4 will be absolutely in a few, order of few seconds. That's it. So it's very, very critical to do such experiments. Very critical to be on the real side of it. Okay, and you take off aircrafts. If you consider aircrafts, it's again, you can't even imagine the safety aspects. It's more than 100% safety it should be there. And, uh, you know, uh, every gadget is now powered by lithium and battery. So you have to be very, very careful. And uh, again, uh, a lot of uh, experiments have been carried out on, uh, uh, you know, the different arrangements of batteries and uh, adjusting the width between the batteries and putting some means to control the fires, etc., etc. All those things have been done enough by people. Okay. Now, let's see the consequences. Now we have seen all the problems as regards to LIBs, lithium and batteries, the firing, thermal propagation, the thermal runaway, all those things. Okay. So it's all because of the consequences of certain things. What makes it? The poor battery thermal management makes it. Now we are for sure know that battery thermal management is very essential. It is a heart of any LIBs. LIBs cannot function. Without a steering wheel, you cannot operate a bus. Like that, it's a steering wheel. So it has to do the job. Without this, it cannot move. So if it is a poor thermal management, if the design is very poor, if the uh, performance is very poor, then it causes all these problems. Overheating of batteries, thermal runaway, ignition, explosion, internal friction, sudden drop, all those things. So to avoid all these things, the best thing is keep cool. Keep cool the batteries. Don't cool it so much, so much, it will not, it will stop functioning. Put it under some safe operating temperature range. Never, never allow the batteries to exceed the temperature range. So what's the range? The range is between, they say, 25 degrees or 20 degrees to 45 degrees under normal charging conditions, normal discharging C-rate conditions. If your C-rate is exceeding, see that it doesn't exceed at least uh, 70 degrees centigrade if the C-rates are very high. So that's very important. So one domain is excessively low temperature, you have to heat the batteries. Excessively high temperatures, you need to cool the batteries. Okay. So overheating of batteries is very, very common in hot climates. So people, uh, those who are you know, regions like us, okay. So subtropical regions and tropical regions and those near the equators and all those things. So we have to be very, very careful with this overheating of batteries due to the hot climates. Okay. So that's very important. And then what should a good BDMS should do? Battery thermal management system should do. So it should heat the batteries under cold climates and keep it to a safe limit. And it should cool the batteries in hot climates to bring it down to the safe limit. And more importantly, this is another important thing which I have not told earlier. Now I'm going to tell that, that is the temperature uniformity within the batteries. Though batteries are made up of some materials inside and they have different uh, you know, thermal conductivities. They have anisotropic properties. That means the properties are going to vary with respect to di uh, directions. So they are not uniform in direction, every direction. Because of that, what happens is the temperature's gradient will be there. So at some point, the battery will be at higher temperature. At some point, it will be lower temperature. So hot zone formation will be there in batteries, inside every battery. This is deadly dangerous, another critical, because the one which is uh, a hot zone, and you have to put your attention to that hot zone very quickly. Otherwise, the hot zone will develop into a thermal runaway zone. 
and terminal run away, you know what will happen next. I don't need to tell now. So therefore, people have found out a limit. Whenever you design a battery thermal management system, you see that not only batteries are cooled, but also kept their battery uniform in the temperature. Less than 5 degrees centigrade is recommended. Okay. So these are the safe operating temperature ranges that we have spoken about. So we can take 35 to 40, but 25 to 40 is recommended. Okay. And then, uh, you know, uh, let's see the uh, cooling aspects. So when people went for cooling by convection, they found that the temperature dropped safely by, you uh, know, depending upon your uh, operation like HC or 5C. You see, under HC operation, the temperature still shoots to 60 degrees centigrade. But that's okay with under HC operation. HC is a huge current. That is one eighth of an hour it will be discharged. Okay. So that's very, very important. Okay. So you see that uh, in seven minutes, if something is going to be discharged and something bad happens, you got time only less than seven minutes to handle. Okay. So very critical operation when you go with higher C ratings of batteries. So one C operation, fine. Okay. Two C, three C, five C, eight C, you go. You have to be very, very careful. So people have done some kind of risk analysis like adiabatic and that no cooling at all. So when you put no cooling at all, the temperature shoots up again to 400 degrees centigrade C when making the materials to melt. Under 15C of operation, you see 15C. So in 15C, if you have 60 minutes, only four minutes, you are going to operate the battery. You're going to discharge the battery in four minutes. That much of current will be drawn. Assume that you have charged the battery for 100% in your cell phone and going to make it to 0% in four minutes. Then imagine the amount of application that's going to draw the current from the cell phone, for example. So please ever don't ever try to attempt to do this. This is very deadly dangerous. That's why it's always good that when you charge the cell phone, do not operate any apps. Do not even try attending a call. Please see that you switch off the cell phone and then take it out from the plug, remove from the plug, then do it. Even while charging, do not have the plug switch on and then insert your uh, you know, cable. That's bad. Okay, you have to switch off, insert the cable, and the final uh, activity that we are going to charge is only to switch on. That's it. Okay, and you have to keep our face off. Whenever we are charging, we, need, we should not put our face near to the phone and then keep on charging. So there are certain protocols that we need to take care of ourselves. It's not a threatening thing, but still, we might have done thousands of times charging until by the time. But think of how many times we have escaped unknowingly by God's grace. Then we need to exercise some caution. Because luck cannot happen always. Okay, so we have to be hundred percent to our con uh, this thing concerns. We need to be careful. And then I have uh, together with my uh, you know scholar, research scholar, we have predicted uh, you know uh, for a thirty-eight one twenty p Sony battery, and uh, we have made uh, the temperature uh, the ad uh, you know under adiabatic conditions to predict how much of the temperature rise could be at. Uh, battery at 1C, 2C and 3C operations. So we found that it's around 16 to 17, uh, you know, uh, degrees centigrade, the temperature rise was there. Okay. So this is what has been found. And again, we made it for a prismatic battery also. And, uh, you know, in our publication, we use this. And we found that temperature uh, rise was around even 60 degrees centigrade for this particular battery. Okay. So these are computational results. We also done some uh, kind of, you know, uh, experiments with the proxy battery arrangement okay that also we have found and uh, the trends in the battery thermal management so this is very very important for us uh, for a research focus it's very important for faculty members to know because a lot of researchers are waiting in this area and uh, the key points that are addressed as regards we all know that it's a c rating of charging or discharging and the charge discharge patterns linked with the driving cycle of any vehicle like uphill and all those things and then the temperature uniformity in batteries because it will lead to hot zones and the temperature gradients, thermal runaway aspects, thermal abuse of lithium ion battery due to accidents, internal and external short circuiting, fast charging, then the cooling technologies, arrangement of batteries, newer materials. All those are key areas of research where it's being addressed as regards to LIBs. And uh, R&D on the cooling of batteries, how do you cool it? Now you see uh, it's getting heated. You say that temperature uh, should be controlled and that should be a battery thermal management system. And how are we are going to do that? How? There are many methods suggested by many people. You can have an air cooling, you can have a liquid cooling. Liquid should not be in touch with the lithium-ion batteries electrode because we all know that it's very sensitive. You cannot have liquids. 
because if you want to use water because of the high heat transfer coefficients and low pumping work required but still use it under non uh, contact method or indirect method so you can use a thing like all nano fluids mineral oils dielectrics using of dielectrics is best because you can even immerse that dielectrics are not going to know uh, conduct electricity so therefore you are cool and uh, this thing but there is another problem with dielectrics because at the time of you know in case of any kind of thermal uh, propagation firing uh, certain dielectrics are there which will not you know uh, protect the firing okay so they are not fire resistant okay so fire resistant dielectric research is another important research to think upon and cooling using the passive means like phase change materials heat pipes and cooling using the mini channel cold plates and then you know cooling with the refrigerants and like r134 and all and the hybrid cooling that is you mix the uh, two different methods of cooling and combine two different methods of cooling like liquid and pcm and etc so many other methods are there okay jet coolings and all these things are all there so these are the methods in which people go for cooling the lithium ion batteries so like you have a battery pack and somebody said there's a cabin air already cold because of the air conditioning available you take that air and blow across the battery pack that's an easy method they say okay so people have made research someone has come come out with uh, this kind of an arrangement for uh, you know supplying water in between the batteries and then they take out the uh, water out or air in a liquid out that's how they do and then people have used pcms at the corner of the you know each and every battery they put some pcm and then they studied how the temperature could be dropped you see phenomenally the temperature drops to your safe limits with operating with this pcms and uh, we have done uh, with the air and dielectric and a combination of these and uh, using pcms all calculations com combinations we have done in a recent publication and we have tried with the air alone we have tried with the pcm alone we have tried with pcm and dielectric we have uh, tried with pcm and air and found out that the PCM uh, with the dielectric or PCM with the air is working fine. So we are able to spout out and find out that uh, the blues are representing the blue color uh, curves are representing the temperature. You see that uh, uh, at one C operation, uh, normally the temperatures are very less, less than 35 degrees centigrade. Whereas if you go for three C operation, the temperature exceeds the safe limit of 40 degrees. You go to 46 degrees. But now by employing or adopting this kind of, you know, uh, the methods, PCM with the air, hybrid methods we can call, uh, we are able to touch down below 36 uh, degrees centigrade uh, using this. This is what we have found out. So this is for a, a kind of, you know, cylindrical battery that we have tested we also uh, just showing uh, showing you the temperature contours that we have uh, achieved with this and these are our results and we are just showing this for a glimpse how the temperatures can be brought down using pcm with the air or pcm with dielectric and see okay adiabatic case is one where there is no cooling at all and see how the batteries are getting heated without any cooling arrangement the moment you start using the dielectric you see how the temperature gradients are in the second column you can see the temperature gradients the third column you can see the absence of gradients Okay, so that's very interesting finding, and uh, then we also, you know, studied with uh, mini channel cold plates. Okay, there also we found that uh, our channels, whatever we have suggested recently, uh, have uh, yielded very good response in battery thermal management, and it brought down conveniently to the temperatures of batteries down to you know 40 or 36 or less than that, even at uh, three C or five C operations. Okay, so here this is what we have proposed. This is not the design that we have proposed. This design is a straight rectangular channel that we have taken, and this is the battery module we have taken. So there are uh, you know uh, five batteries per module, and we have taken only two and a half batteries. That's why we are showing here some two and a half batteries here. This is the module that we have taken, and uh, each module on both sides are supported uh, or cooled by a cold plate. This cold plate has micro uh, mini channels, and through the channels the water flows. So therefore, the water doesn't contact. Okay. Uh, the batteries here. So the cold, this is what we call a cold plate. Now we have studied this uh, particular arrangement. We have taken a battery, 45 ampere hour battery, and uh, uh, made the calculations. And then uh, what we did was instead of studying the straight channels, uh, we thought of improving the design or the cooling further by proposing, uh, you know, nearly seven different designs. Okay. So we did with different designs, rectangular slots, square wave channels, the below channels, sine wave channels, arc channels, the flow chart uh, slot channels, and the zigzag channel. We found the D6 and D7, the zigzag and the circular slot to yield better results in terms of the pressure drop, as well as in terms of the temperature performance and the uniformity. These two are the best performers compared to the other designs. That's what we have showcased in this paper. And uh, you can go through this publication and find out 
the other details. And uh, these are the thermal, thermal hydraulic characteristics of uh, these designs that we are talking about. And uh, design one to design seven, we have compared and we found that, you know, with zigzag channels, yes, the pressure drop was very high, but the cooling achieved was excellent. Okay. So the maximum battery temperature, right, the red curve, it shows it is a minimal with this uh, design seven, but the pressure drop is maximum. Okay, but with P6, the pressure drop is also minimal and the temperature rise is also excellent. So that's how we were able to uh, get it. Okay, so D6 was found to be better. And in terms of, uh, you know, the pressure drop, okay, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, a kind of uh, the uh, temperature rise that we get, D6 and D7 were uh, better performance compared to the other designs. That's what uh, we found out through this. And then uh, there are other cooling techniques studied by different people. We are going to just showcase it and run through these slides. That's all. So we have uh, batteries. Uh, we have uh, different channels, channels of different configurations. And uh, people have studied this type of a configuration. You can have your own customized design. Uh, somebody has put, uh, you know, dimples on the, uh, you know, surfaces of the mini channels and they studied the effect of dimples very recently. And if it is a cylindrical, Tesla has their own, uh, you know, method of circulating the fluids. Okay, and you can also immerse the fluids uh, within the battery pack. You can even immerse. Some people have uh, gone with some kind of arrangement like this, where in the sides you have the cold plates and cold plates are circulated over this, and the arrangement of uh, you know the way in which it's going to move that is also very important. Okay, all these uh, interesting things are there. Liquid cooling, how it's being done uh, for a five series five parallel module like this. Okay, so they have inserted some, you know, finned tubes and then they pass water and then they found how it uh, reduces the overall temperature within the batteries. And then this is a one more arrangement with a hybrid cooling arrangement where, uh, you know, the PCM is there and then the liquid cooling is also there. And, uh, you know, how compact it could be made and you can use the tubes and pass the fluids and then cool it using the, uh, uh, you know, liquid. And then you have a passive cooling PCM also. PCM plays a major role. And very recently we have communicated one paper telling that, uh, uh, you know, PCMs are not that much, uh, you know, uh, advantages when it comes for uh, fast charging batteries. So that's what we have found out. And then uh, liquid cooling of uh, LIBs with cold plates. This is how a stack or complete uh, uh, module of or a pack of lithium ion batteries would be like. And then you can have your own kind of customized, uh, you know, cold plates and the movement of fluids. And, uh, you know, the prediction of temperatures as we have uh, seen with the thermal issue, so on and so forth. So you see the maximum battery temperatures are so huge. Okay, so phenomenal. So you need to literally take care of this because you have copper and aluminium. Okay, so they will melt at around, you know, 600 and, you know, kind of uh, 1000 degrees centigrade and all. Suppose if they melt, then uh, it cannot be done. Okay, so everything will be a uh, this thing, failure, complete failure. And then, uh, you know, the maximum temperatures uh, you know, reported by in the literature, okay, either with poor cooling or no cooling, either, okay. So even for 15 ampere hour battery, they were able to control the temperature with, uh, you know, to 69 degrees centigrade. That is good because it's 5C operation, okay. So 5C is a big operation. Even the 10 ampere hour battery with 5C operation, okay. So you see 50 amperes, you no, know, it will be drawn, okay. So in, in one fifth of an hour. So, therefore, it's in 12 minutes, you say, so this 50 amperes uh, will be drawn in this case, in 10 amperes. So, just drawing 50 amperes is big. And you see the temperature is only 67 degrees centigrade. Okay. So, that's how the cooling is there. But if you have very good cooling, you can even bring down the temperature to 50 degrees or even less than 40 degrees. Okay. That's very important. And uh, here uh, goes my conclusions based on the study. It's going to be uh, 11 o'clock, the time allotted to me. I think I'm on the time now. And uh, the main conclusions drawn are like this. Lithium-ion batteries are the future power sources of electric vehicles. And uh, lithium-ion batteries need a special care on their uh, cooling as they generate excessive heat during the charging and the discharging process. And newer methods are to be developed to arrest thermal runaways and thermal propagation as well. Research is active globally on the development of efficient lithium-ion batteries. And uh, safe battery thermal management systems is a prime requirement for uh, lithium ion batteries to maintain the temperatures less than the safe margin of 40 degrees centigrade. You can't go below 20 and all because it will uh, drop your uh, performance. So you cannot go too cold. That's also important on the other hand. Okay. And battery temperature uniformity is very important. It should be within this 5 degree margin. And the scope of R&D on thermal management of LIBs is wide and challenging for uh, many of the heat transfer engineers, we can say. And then uh, newer materials are required for those those who are working on materials aspect. For them, 
there's a lion share awaiting for them to you know find out new materials which will generate less amount of heat so that the uh, you know uh, disadvantages or demerits as regards the thermal values are mitigated somehow and uh, the success of ev market solely depends on libs and libs solely depend on thermal management and there are other types of management also available now like for example it's a control system management overall management of because iot can be used in order to predict which cell is getting into a thermal runaway region or a time so that can be predicted using iot's you can have the power of it digital power and find out even or spot well before an incident occurs and then you can take an adequate measure so that could be a number of you uh, know ideas in order to prevent any kind of incidents uh, with the, the libs and uh, beyond this there's another problem finding the lithium material okay the amount of lithium that's available on earth is limited very very limited and not at all places you have the lithium okay countries only few gifted countries they have the lithium resource so if the entire world is going to go electric where is the lithium for it there is no answer that's why people are going for recycling from the already available batteries people so uh, the huge market is awaiting for people who wish to work anyone can work on waste management okay so there's a huge market huge wealth is there in the waste electronic waste especially especially in the battery side and more on that what is what is important uh, in lithium and batteries is about the you no know, the uh, thermal propagation so that is very important fire resistant materials are to be found out in order to find out you know uh, how this uh, can be uh, you know compromised and how we can bin over okay or prevent this thermal propagation between the batteries and the arrangement in which the batteries need to be done okay all these things are very very interesting and uh, uh, there are other batteries awaiting in, in the market technologies are awaiting like flow batteries okay so flow batteries are slowly going to take uh, the market share of lithium ion batteries in terms of uh, large power requirement segments large uh, segments where the power requirement is huge because flow batteries cannot uh, at the moment it cannot fit into a kind of uh, low power requirement uh, okay as what this libs are neatly doing okay so these are very very important areas so one has to really uh, look upon and then focus their work on research especially on the uh, battery side so this is how the battery thermal management is being done so through this session what we did was like we uh, made a small uh, kind of a discussion on the scenario that's the prevailing scenario of the automotives and where the evs are going to match and fit and play their role and for evs what about the batteries and what are the types of the batteries and why the lithium ion batteries and uh, with the lithium ion batteries how the development has happened with the uh, lithium ion batteries and uh, the and the uh, merits and the challenges on the demerits with the uh, lithium ion batteries was seen and we have also emphasized that uh, lithium ion batteries cannot function without an effective battery thermal management systems or uh, a cooling system it cannot function so and then we discussed about uh, the reasons for uh, this these type of batteries getting heated and we also found out the ways in order to mitigate this and then how effectively this battery thermal management systems are currently under development by different researchers across the globe and what are the potential risks that are involved with the uh, failure of ba lithium ion batteries all those things have we have seen and the state of the art research that's happening now 2021 until or 2022 until we have seen that and uh, we also seen the scope for further research in uh, battery thermal management aspects so with us uh, we have to only wait and see whether the game is over for this side left hand side and a new game but rather it's an old game but still it's going to be a new game that's going to start afresh in down the lane and uh, with us i would like to extend my sincere thanks to all of you and if there is any sharing of thoughts now we can that's all sir from my side so thank you sir for your excellent session sir thank you thank you so much um, so uh, actually we are actually running short of time uh, now the session is open to participants uh, you can raise your questions on chat box sir so, one question from participants sir yes sir uh, from utkarsh verma so how to decide which battery shapes would be good for making the battery pack what excellent. criteria are there excellent excellent it is an excellent question see uh, it is all on the research part 
sorry i'm hearing some voice yeah so uh, which battery pack the design of the battery pack itself the shape the arrangement the way in which you are going to arrange the way in which the flow dynamics is going to happen so the flow characteristics all those things can be first simulated you can vary the width okay the space between the batteries you can have some redundant batteries to arrest the fire the firing and fire propagation it all depends upon the size first that is available to you and uh, the weight which the vehicle is limited to weight which you can handle and also you can focus your attention on the flow dynamics how you are going to cool if you are going to cool with air you have to see that local hot zones are not there so all these hydrodynamics come into picture whenever you know you deal with such kind of arrangements so arrangements do have an impact on this so it has to be done simulation and experiments both have to be done and evolved with an optimal kind of a design i think i have answered the question yes sir thank you sir sir yes, uh, the next question is from uh, uttira ramya bala so is recycling of lithium ion battery facilities available facilities available yes people are already doing it recycling technologies are available and many startups have come and uh, even in chennai nearby chennai there is a plant available and soon isro is going to come out with some kind of uh, you know protocols already uh, they are guiding the uh, battery development in india everyone knows that and uh, waste conversion of e waste to useful and uh, recapturing the lithiums are a hard take opportunity and research is in progress and uh, i am sorry that i have not worked on that too much on that uh, and i don't know that also on too much of uh, chemistry is involved and one i has to re really ponder into maybe the sessions like this should address one aspect completely on recycling of batteries so maybe i can recommend such topic can be addressed in the future for similar kind of workshops or uh, knowledge sharing exercises okay so th but the scope is unlimited as regards this uh, you know lithium ion recovery as a waste from uh, this waste electronic goods yes sir thank you sir so we are moving for the last question sir so how can battery management system functions can be validated sorry how how can battery management system functions can be validated ah see whenever you do a, a validation exercise what you have to do is first you do you have to do with a proxy battery module so you take a proxy battery and what you do is you try to uh, do all kind of you know stuff using a proxy battery because it's not going to explode okay so you can do some critical analysis and then you have to do with some real batteries with uh, the real charging okay you have the battery chargers available now battery cyclers we call that so battery cyclers are very expensive so you have to uh, if you have a battery cycler facility you just have to develop one kind of a prototype and then test it then you have to deploy it it has got stages deployment stage in the real electric vehicles that's how the companies like ashok lilands and the companies like tesla and other uh, you know growing emerging industries that's how they work they test it and see validation can only be done at this process that this scale that's all first simulation then proxy then you have to go for a small battery cycling real time testing with one single prototype and then you go for the real scale versions have a test drive do all the kind of exercises have a safe launch this is how then you have to connect between is an iteration process connect from the simulation model to the real time model you have to put those figures into your simulation rework and reoptimize your design that's how the simulation it's a stage so this stage should have a connect between the person who is doing the simulation and the person who is the end user supported by all the intermediaries okay so this is how the battery thermal management research should go on for a kind of a successful validated uh, kind of uh, product to be launched so that's how the research is on now i hope i answered that question yes sir so thank you so much sir for your patient answering uh, for all the queries raised by the participants uh, yes sir, sir uh, with your permission i would like to also welcome the next session to serve person dr febin daya sir classic sir so thanks a lot i would like to give a small note of thanks uh, i thank a lot uh, dr suresh for giving me this opportunity when he approached me for this and then i also thank a lot uh, uh, the institution isho college of engineering and also my own uh, institution here ssn college of engineering for uh, uh, permitting me to have such kind of knowledge sharing exercise and uh, that's a good opportunity meeting with you all and uh, sharing with you the uh, you know 
the uh, trends in uh, battery thermal management and uh, uh, it really uh, encouraged me to you know uh, have another kind of reading and add some more knowledge so i should thank you for giving me such an opportunity and thanks a lot uh, overall and look forward to some other kind of exercises in the future years to come and we hope that we go into a kind of a green future and it, let it be green for all and happiness for all thank you so much yes sir thank you sir at this juncture i would also thank on behalf of participants um for uh, having as a resource person for uh, the 10th session uh, for accepting your invitation and sparing your time your precious time uh, to give you a